prosecution outlined how accounting practices oh, fuck. Did not what kind of likeness is that procedure. if they were great artists they'll be in a museum i'm fucking fodder for cartoonists now Welcome to episode 58 of Gutter Boys. Gutter Boys is a small press comics podcast about the ins and the outs and the highs and the lows of small press comics. Uh, I am Cam Del Rosario, along with my co-host JB Rowe. And today uh, is a special day. We are here as part of the official 2021 Autoptic Festival digital programming. Very happy to be here uh, with them twice in a row. As a little change up to the intro, but similar to last year, we actually have festival organizer and Minneapolis-based cartoonist Pete Fakey here today with us. Pete's been skateboarding all summer, so instead of Pharrell being skateboard yeah, P, drawn. Pete is now skateboard P. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen me on Instagram, that's why. I mean, I'm doing shit I couldn't do when I was a kid. I got my kickflips back. I landed a heel flip yesterday. Ooh, hell yeah. Got a burial kickflip. Five O's, fifty fifties, no slides. Yeah, I'm getting some shit. Whoa, <laughs> yeah, man, <laughs> Pete's doing the work. This, this oh, is nice. what people are coming to the for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> going to the X Games. Oh, are you worried? Yeah. Are you worried about like falling and wrecking your wrists or anything though? Not to put that in your head, but does that ever cross your mind? Uh, not too much. I t- I'm, I'm, okay. I fuck my ankles up for sure. My ankles are like maybe fucked up forever now. Oh shit. <laughs> But <laughs> Good. I mean, I just I, I wear a ankle brace when I skate. I just turned oh, 29. Okay, okay. Right. So I just okay. like I can't fucking bounce back like I used to. If I'm falling, right. yeah. usually I'm not. I'm good enough now where I'm not falling as much. And uh, I'm not usually falling on my hands too much. But like once in a while, you'll fucking get them. And then it like turns into a magnet and you just keep falling on them. So I got some wrist guards when that happens. But Hell most yes. days it's no okay. big deal. You know, I'm getting better yeah. at like skating within my zone and uh, playing it more or less safe, safe as you can. You should go out there just fully geared up, like elbow pads. (laughs) I went, pads, I, I went out helmet. with uh, I went out with Johnny Sampson in Chicago. Uh, I was in Chicago last week and I went out mm-hmm. skating with him and he had full gear. But he's you know, he's like in his 40s and he's skating bulls. So, oh, oh yeah, shit. Yeah. You know, I didn't know yeah. Johnny Sampson was a skater. That's cool. Yeah, I'm trying to do like a full, I'm bringing my board to cake next time and I'm trying to like get like a cake sesh because I think there's a bunch of cartoonists who skate and we just like, <laughs> there's a bunch of us out there. <laughs> So I'm trying to do a cake sesh. I'm trying to like do like a little park takeover and and bring all the aging cartoonists with their skateboards. Yeah, I'll come watch. Um, are you, are you going to bring it? Are you going to bring it to the trip? <laughs> oh, he's not. He, he's not coming to the cabin. Uh, oh, you're not. For some reason, no, I assumed no. you were. No, okay. I don't. I wish you were. Uh, I'm very, I'm very, very broke right now, mm-hmm. and I can't oh, true, plan yeah. that far ahead during the pandemic with I my day job. That makes sense. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotcha. Well, uh, let's get on topic to why we're here today. <laughs> yeah, let's get on topic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on topic with Autoptic. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> the festival has been multi parts this year, right? You all were doing something in May, if I'm not mistaken, and then we're finishing it up in August. Yeah, we're actually going to do another one in fall. We're doing sort of like mini seasons um, year round during the pandemic. And then this is like festival season. So this one is kind of twice the size. We're trying to go bigger than we went last year. And then we'll have another uh, set of maybe like four or five smaller episodes in the fall. Hell yeah. Well, we are uh, very happy to have Jaime Hernandez on the back end of this episode. Hell yeah. Yeah. Huge, huge personal get for me. Uh, you know, that guy is the god to me. So to be able to talk to Jaime was a dream come true, something that like I thought would be like the highlight of the show. And we did it, you know, within 50 episodes. So I want to thank 
Pete for setting that up for us with Autoptic. My pleasure. Yeah, stay tuned for that. But uh, more importantly, I want to talk about what else is going on because you're dropping content throughout the week. So what's happening? Today's Monday, the 23rd, when they're listening to this. Uh, we're not recording it yeah, so on this the 23rd, is... but yeah, act like it's the 23rd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is day one. So today it's going to be uh, Jaime with you guys. And then I have an interview with Pascal Girard, who just put a new book out with DNQ. It's like a maternity murder mystery is the pitch on that one. It's a new mom like going to solve a crime. I'm not describing it very well right now, but it's a great book. I really enjoyed reading it. And uh, we had a cool conversation. And then uh, local Blue Delaquanti is interviewed by Bob Algio. Blue does the book Oh Human Star webcomic. And then you can get print copies of that one too. So one thing that's different this year from last year is you guys are not hosting every episode. So if you want to check out more of this, make sure to look up Autoptic in whatever your podcatcher is and uh, go subscribe there because we got more coming on Wednesday and Friday too. Yeah. And so this will be available in our feed, but all the other content, including this episode, will be in the Autoptic feed. Do you want to talk about what's coming later on in the week? Yeah. Wednesday is going to be, I'm talking to uh, Wang Pixen or Pix. She just put out a fantastic book. That was a really, really good conversation too. Really thoughtful artist. And then local Trung Li Nguyen, Trungles, another really, really good book. Um, somebody that we've been trying to get for a long time. And Josh Cotter is on Wednesday. He's talking to Sean Knickerbocker. Hell yeah. And then uh, Friday, we've got a reading from Kyler Roberts. That'll be on the YouTube. Um, and that's hosted by Rob Kirby, local legend. Um, Leomi Sadler on Thick Lines. So we got another episode with uh, another podcast this year. Part of Going Bigger, teaming up. And uh, another reading from Shira Spector. So check out the YouTube. All of this will be on YouTube too is just like simple, you know, it'll be like a title card with a wave animation and you can listen to stuff there if you like it there. And then the readings are also going to be in the podcast feed as audio only versions. So if you just want to hear somebody read a comic without seeing it, I don't know, might be interesting, but there's an interview ahead of the reading too. So it should be cool. Did uh, Kyler do readings from uh, Begging Chart? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Great book. I actually just finished it not too long ago. Great books. So looking forward to that. Hell yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, I know with the pandemic casting a shadow, you don't really know too much, but um, Autoptic, you know, the future of Autoptic, it's going to go on into the fall with more digital content. Anything planned after that that uh, the listeners should look out for? Yeah, I mean, follow us on socials and get on the email list or whatever you can do to stay current. The plan is to be back in about a year for an in-person show. We still got our contract signed with the venue. They've been really, really good about rolling over and uh, working with us. And, you know, I think this is <laughs> our, our uh, postponements, I think, work better for them anyway. So we oh, got yeah. a contract signed. We're planning on being back. In the meantime, I think we're going to keep trying to do more digital content and some of the more of those mini seasons we were talking about. I think that's it for right now. Alrighty, Awesome. So uh, just to kind of put a bow on it, web addresses, social media, YouTube channel, uh, drop all the links real quick, or at least, you know, tell them what to search for. Yeah, it's uh, just Google Autoptic. I think that'll give you your best stuff. Autoptic.org. Um, that's a pretty good landing page. Uh, there should be a link to the email list there. So whenever we have a big announcement, there's always a big, a big email that goes out. So that's a pretty good way to stay up to. And then I think it's Autoptic Fest on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, we're on Facebook too, if you, if you still use Facebook. Cool. All right. Well, JB, you got anything before we uh, wrap this up? I'm still waiting on my friend Kimber to send me more information about their organization. They were on a trip, so they just got back. So we'll likely have details about that uh, on the uh, the next episode with our buddy Nate Garcia's. Uh, so stay tuned for that if you're interested, and uh, we'll be able to give you the the lowdown on uh, how to donate and sort of what the time frame will be for that. Hell yeah. So yeah, stick around for that and our interview with Jaime Hernandez. And we want to thank Pete and Autoptic for, you know, including us this year and uh, for also coming on the show again. Uh, check out all the content and we'll catch you after the break. We'll be right back. Floodland brings together a series of personal and natural disasters featured in comics by Australian cartoonist and cult hero Jonathan McBurney. 
Beginning with the protagonist's chronic illness, it relates a long period of bizarre artistic practices, awkward art school relationships, the brutal reality of the 9-to-5 grind of the submerging artist, and culminates in the massive flood in his hometown. The peripheral characters whose lives orbit the same places and occasionally overlap through mundane circumstances include Batskiat, an artist come superhero whose successes are vastly out of proportion with his talents, Picasso Minotaur, a brawny beefcake sculptor with fire in his belly and hate in his heart, and Kirby Kelly, a hapless and constantly flummoxed experiment gone wrong. Floodland is a 96-page hardcover available from ArgleBargleBooks.com. Check out JonathanMcBurney.com and King underscore of underscore nails on Instagram for more beefcake, wrestling, and existential conundrums. Rust Belt Review is a quarterly comics lit magazine featuring serialized and short form comics from some of the most exciting cartoonists in the small press scene today. Volume 1 features work from Gutter alums, M.S. Harkness, Audra Stang, and Caleb Arecchio, along with work by Andrew Greenstone, Sean Knickerbocker, and Juan Jose Fernandez. You can order your copy of Rust Belt Review today by going to rustbeltreview.org. Enter in promo code GUTTER to receive two bucks off your order. Again, that website is rustbeltreview.org. Promo code GUTTER. To our program. And welcome back to the show. We are joined finally with our very special guest today as part of the Autoptic 2021 lineup. Uh, we are joined by very well-known, internationally renowned uh, Jaime Hernandez uh, to talk a little bit about his uh, new book, uh, which will be out on August 3rd. August 3rd, Queen of the Ring comes out. And yeah. uh, if uh, this airs after August 3rd and you don't have it, what are you doing? Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely pick this one up. I mean, I, uh, this is this is a wonderful book. I mean, it is just the, the drawings in it are just fantastic. I've been staring at them for the last two days uh, nonstop. But uh, anyway, uh, how are you doing today? Me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Jaime. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing really good. <laughs> so uh, Jaime is joining us uh, this morning. Are you still in uh, Oxnard? Or are you in LA now? Where are you uh, at these days? I'm uh, I'm in Hollywood. Hollywood. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Are you liking that? I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I've always wanted to live in Hollywood, but I thought I was going to get as far as Pasadena, but now uh, I'm living in Hollywood. Yeah. Very awesome. Are you uh, right in the middle of everything? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of walking stuff to walk to, which uh, I like. Yeah. Hell yeah. We did want to take a different approach with this episode and talk mainly about wrestling since the book is about wrestling. And uh, it was uh, 40 years worth of drawings. And uh, one thing I did want to touch base on is uh, throughout the book, you know, we got a chance to look over it. Uh, you did say that this was all personal drawings and uh, you didn't intend to show anybody. So I do want to just ask, you know, what made you decide to finally share this with the world? Well, I've I always liked the work I was doing, but I just never thought anyone would care, you know? And so I uh, I always thought, like, maybe, uh, you know, hey, one day I'll make a book about this, you know? And it wasn't until uh, Katie kind of said, look, I'm one of the few people who have ever seen this stuff. You know, I think it's kind of unfair that I get to see it. <laughs> And the rest of the world doesn't. And I thought, well, that's cool because I always kind of wanted to make a book of it, but I just was too lazy, you know, to approach anyone to do it. And uh, so that was good timing, you know, and, you know, part of it was scary because this stuff I never thought anyone would see, you know, it was just my own personal stuff that I would do when I wasn't doing Love and Rockets. You know, and I was just doing it for myself. So there was no uh, editing involved, you know, no one not thinking about an audience, you know, even if it kind of looks the same as like, I put the same amount of work as I do my Love and Rocket stuff. But uh, it was a little different because I kind of didn't care about editors or anything, you know, or readers. So uh, I don't know. And, and it was just a good time to do it because uh because i um i sit there sometimes and go man i am such a failure as an artist i don't do anything outside of love and rockets blah 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 boo boo hoo for me <laughs> and then i realize oh this is 
totally outside of Lemon Rockets. So uh, that was also a, a boost. Absolutely. And the book looks great. Like, do you have more nerves putting it out since it is so personal and close to you as you know, it's kind of like pretty much your personal sketchbooks and, you know, the artwork that you work on in your own time, like you mentioned. Yeah, I I was scared at first because I thought, you know, okay, what do I think I'm a weirdo or or what? And then I thought, well, who cares? (laughs) You know, but at first I was nervous because because like I said, it wasn't meant for anyone to see but me, you know, but then I got over it and. I'm kind of excited to hear what people think. (laughs) No, for sure. And, you know, so obviously these are four decades worth of drawings. So wrestling is the focal point of the book. And wrestling has even showed up in Love and Rockets. I mean, it's obvious that both you and your brothers are fans. Um, Is this something that you keep up with, like, pretty regularly? Um, Like, as far as, like, currently watching, like, what's on TV with wrestling? Like, how do you consume wrestling nowadays? Um, You know, I check the channels, you know, I, I, I know which wrestling shows are on, you know, weekly and I check in on them sometimes, but I'm, I mostly like to check, uh, YouTube because mm. I like to look for videos of, uh, you know, backwoods wrestling. I like to right. the, the really small federations, you know, where they have a ring in the parking lot, you know, right. Yeah. And stuff like that. <laughs> And and the un, you know and the unknown stars. Some of them have become big stars, gone to WWE or something else. But uh, you know they started out in someone's backyard or or stuff like that. I always like the underdog stuff. Like when WWF, you know, exploded. I kind of liked it, but then I went to WCW because it was the lesser superstar one. You know, even if it tried just as hard. So I I guess I've always gone for the underdog thing, you know. So are you pretty in tune with like the independent scene? Like that's kind of what you're seeking out nowadays? Um, I I guess in tune, meaning I I just like to check it out, you know. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, But, you know, there's so many that, uh, you know, I don't even know names or anything. So I I, uh, mostly check out the women, of course. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But, um I don't know. It, it's kind of like uh, when when I was little or young, younger, and you know, a wrestling show. You were lucky to get a women's match. You know, so I, I sat through a lot of boring stuff, or or just wrestlers I didn't care about, just waiting. Like, hey, maybe they'll have a women's match this week, and you know, and, and then I'm there for four months just watching and watching. You know, so uh, I saw a lot of wrestling because I was waiting for something else. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever get into uh the uh like 80s Japanese women's wrestling scene? Yeah, yeah, we had a we had a uh like a TV station what they call in those days UHF channels, you know. Oh were, yeah, yeah. And there was one that was uh a half Japanese, half Spanish station and they would show the women's stuff in the mid 70s. But, you know, I didn't have my own TV. So I had to sit there in the living room and go, Ma, can I watch this? And <laughs> and she'd go, sure. And she'd be ironing and the whole family would be sitting there watching. And I would just be like, God, why don't you guys leave me alone? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I kind of got into that. And then just odd chat in those, in those days, um, you know, the birth of cable, just a lot of odd stations would show stuff like, uh, you know, that's how, how I learned about like, uh, the hardcore wrestling stuff that was almost by accident. You know, I did, I didn't know that stuff existed. All the Sabu kind of stuff. ECW. That's what I, yeah, I, I couldn't yeah, think yeah. of. <laughs> and then there was WEW, the women's one, you know, they, I would just find them like one thirty in the morning on some odd channel and stuff. So that, that's, that's kind of, the fun thing now now it's youtube i do that with you know i just search for just the the weirdest uh federations because i like those best because they seem to try harder you know have you seen videos from that promotion called zona 23 no it's uh it's kind of the (laughs) hardcore stuff but um it like they it's in like a junkyard the kind of stuff you like (laughs) but they do crazy stuff uh there's women's wrestlers but it's pretty uh it's brutal it's pretty brutal so if (laughs) if you don't like blood and stuff i don't know if i would recommend it like they're power bombing each other through like car windshields and stuff um (laughs) 
So yeah. <laughs> your mileage may vary, but if you're looking for something fun in a junkyard, uh, I would right, check that right, out. Right. That's a, I, sometimes that's fun. And then after a while, you're kind of like, okay, I, this guy doesn't even hide his blades, you know, <laughs> you know, it's no longer a hidden thing. <laughs> Were you watching throughout the 90s, like when it really blew up? Like I know Hulk Hogan was like in the 80s, but like when like The Rock and Stone Cold, were you in all that? Um, I read yeah, a yeah. A lot of times I would I would uh, I would stop watching, and then something would bring me back. Like I would just go like God, I haven't checked this out in five years, and then mm-hmm. there'd be something new going on, and I'd go, Wow, it's changed in the last five years. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I, I really got into that time when they were when they were hiring uh, soap opera writers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and everything was a story. And I thought that was very clever. I thought they did really well with those. And then what was it? Um, WCW uh, stole the writers or something because they paid them more or something. So they had all the fantastic storylines. It, it, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a time that I, you know, I don't think it'll ever happen again in the wrestling business. You know, I think for a lot of reasons, but um, I don't think there's that like internal competition anymore that's taken seriously at that level anymore. Yeah. But I do think, like you, like you said, to me, you know, the fun of it is the storylines, the over the top characters, and it almost seems like they're moving away from that. It seems like everybody wants to be like a better athlete in the ring. Yeah. With the modern product, so do you enjoy that, or do you are you mainly into the you know showman side of it? And it's hard to say because um, all the uh, strutting and boasting by the wrestlers now seem to be taken more seriously than when I was watching it in the 70s or something. You know, I really enjoyed a heel like, you know, boasting in an interview and then getting their ass kicked. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, you know and I just love that, that sense of humor that only wrestling has, you know, nowhere else in the world that has it. I just see a lot less of it now because the fan base has changed. The the way younger kids look at it is more of a badass thing than a clown thing, you know. And I'm not to. It's not to say that I only like the clown stuff, but you know, I just had the best time listening to a Flair interview. In oh the yeah, news, you know, or something even earlier than that. So like some deep South wrestling stuff where some guy in a cowboy hat is uh, boasting and, and strutting around and, and just that stuff is just uh, fun, fun, funner for me. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because I feel like the West coast in, in Los Angeles and in California in general, a lot of the wrestling heels that came out of that territory were very much into the, cl- what we know as the classic heel, the, mm-hmm very over the top, veering towards feminine, boastful, attractive guys like Gorgeous George and classy Freddie Blassie. Mm-hmm. That's the dudes that would strut out and it would rile the crowd up, both because like they were too boastful and also because they were kind of, I guess, not classical men, quote unquote. Like masculinity was very much kind of thrown out the window at times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we see that today, granted a little more twisted like i feel like gold dust was I, I don't know if you remember gold dust from mm-hmm. wwf sure. Sure. uh but he kind of took that that gimmick and turned it on its head in a way and right. really playing on people's i guess bordering on homophobia basically right 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 yeah 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 that's that's usually my favorite stuff you know yeah um, it's fun to watch yeah, yeah i agree have you uh, heard of pwg out there Jaime? PWG. It's, no. It's it's based out of Reseda. Yeah, Reseda. I think they moved to the Globe Theater in LA now because oh, their yeah, old building right. got torn yeah, down. Yeah. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it stands for Pro Wrestling Guerrilla. And uh, it's for a while there, for like uh, the late 2010s, like the last five years, it was probably the best wrestling in the world. Um, if you no, ever get no. a chance, though, check it out. Like, go to a show. I know that like it's kind of weird. Like, a lot of celebrities and stuff go. I know it was like a fun thing to do for a while. But if you ever uh, hear of a show around, I would recommend it because I think you'd uh, enjoy yourself at least. Oh, cool. That's that's Reseda, the Valley. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They would do a lot of like hardcore intergender matches. Oh, those are always fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, it's one of those setups where like, there's no barrier. So like the fans like run and like pound on the ring, you know, but it's, well, it's well, really, yeah. it's really strange because like, uh, I saw a statistic recently that was like, uh, pretty much out of the last like 10 years, like every PWG champion has went to WWE. So they always yeah. get the stars before yeah. they're the stars too. Oh, right. Oh, okay. So, um, but yeah, that's a pretty fun uh, promotion that's out there. I know that there was like championship wrestling of Hollywood going on for a while um, that looked pretty fun, but I'd never really seen a whole show. Yeah. And it's, uh, and they started, they film in Port Wainimi, which is uh, Oxnard, basically where I'm from, which, okay. I, which I thought was amazing. You know, I mean, they still say it's from, from Hollywood, but it says, you know, next taping, you know, Port Wainimi. And I'm like, Aaron Oxnard. <laughs> and then, and then, uh, yeah, and that show, uh, they moved it to one in the morning and I, you know, I'm old, so I, I can't stay up, cause, <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I love the smaller, the small shows and, and, and all that. Yeah. Does your uh, brother Gilbert still watch? I recently like found an old comics journal issue where they interviewed the wives of a bunch of cartoonists and Carol was interviewed there and uh, they were asking about like habits and she seemed embarrassed by like the verbiage in the interview. But she was like, yeah, we have our uh, shows we watch every Monday and Thursday. That's our wrestling nights. Is he still in yeah. tune with wrestling? Yeah, it, you know, is actually more her. Oh, OK. Uh, Gilbert, Gilbert and I one day. um we just started telling her about wrestling and about the wrestling world and all this stuff. And she just got, was like, what? <laughs> and <laughs> so she really got into it. And so he got into WWF and then, um, turned to WCW, you know, and, uh, just, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of mostly her. And then we would all go to, uh, shows in LA, you know, and it was a fun, it was fun time. You know? Hell yeah. So who are some of your like favorite all time wrestlers? Oh, well, you got Blassie, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, because I saw Blassie when I was a little kid in the 60s, a medium-sized kid in the 70s, and then <laughs> up till he was, uh, you know, manager and That's stuff. Awesome. So he was always, he was always, you know, doing some. All he had to do was open his mouth and I was entertained. He didn't have to wrestle. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> um, yeah, in the early 70s, he had this, he had the thing where he, he would bite. You know, and the audience would just go, you know, bite, Freddy, bite, bite, Freddy, bite. You know, this was in uh, L.A. at the Olympic Auditorium. That was the wrestling I got on my TV. So, like, Blassie, um, you know, I got to see Piper in the 70s because he took, he took L.A. over, you know, single-handedly and just, like, turned the place upside down. And that was fun. Um, who, who else do I like? Uh, oh, there's a lot of them, all from different generations, you know. Because, you know, I started watching in the mid-60s, and then, you know, like, guys like Bobo Brazil and, and Blassie and, and, and The Destroyer and guys like that. Uh, by the mid-70s, you know, it was like Piper and Keith Franks, who became Adrian Adonis, you know, because they, they started to come to Oxnard. They started to wrestle in Oxnard, and that was when I first saw my first live matches. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a lot of fun. Um, let's see. Whew. So many. He was, uh, Flair. Of course I love Flair. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how He's that like guy the prototype, could, uh, you know, like wearing... the perfect pro wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I don't know how he was able to always, when he had a suit on, you know, in his shades and talking mess and then someone would come and knock him out. How his shoe always flew off. <laughs> just laying there, you know, knocked out. <laughs> but I guess that takes real talent. <laughs> yeah, Flair was a bump machine. That guy could flop around the ring like no one's business. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, someone someone was talking about this recently that they were saying, you know, just to get the sh the fans excited, all they had to do was give Flair and Dusty Rhodes a mic. And those two guys were just carrying the night, you know. Mm -hmm. And that that was uh, that was the best stuff for me, you know. Pretty soon the wrestling was the background stuff, you know. Yeah. And the personalities were were forefront. I don't know if you've seen much like uh, newer WWE, but Ric Flair's daughter's been around like the last like five or six years and uh, wearing the robes and everything. Yeah. And uh, yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, and uh, she just 
lost last night or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah she, she did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I watched all the pay-per-views and everything this weekend because it was the first time with the crowd. And it really is crazy how much the crowd does add to a wrestling event. Um, it just felt like a completely different show than the stuff that's been on the past oh, year with right. the screens. Yeah. Uh, So did you ever get a chance to meet any of these uh, wrestlers? I know Blassie had a tie to comics through Glenn Bray from the Fantagraphics book I I read. They apparently did like a record and stuff together. Did you ever get a chance to meet any of these guys? I never met Blassie. I know know Glenn Bray really well. And he's told me millions of stories, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. But um, I met uh, John Tolas, who was was the big uh, rival to Blassie in the early 70s. And I... You know, introduce myself, and I called him the maniac, and he goes, "What's my name?" And I go, ooh, ooh, "I mean, the Golden Greek." And he was like, "That's better." And all of a sudden, he's a nice guy. <laughs> you know? And uh, but I remember, you know, being a ten-year-old watching the the Tolas Blassi feud and hating Tolas so much that I couldn't picture him being a baby. And them saying, let's name him Jonathan. <laughs> you know, I, I just so hated him so much. So what happens when you become an adult? You love him. Because <laughs> you know? he did so much for my growing up. But um, yeah, uh, let's see. I've, I've met a few, but just to take the pictures. Because, you know, there was a, at the time of the, um, in the mid 80s, when the, the WWF or um, WCW would come to town um in the back behind the behind the stands you know some of the wrestlers just hanging out talking to fans or or stuff so you got to go and get your picture taken you know and stuff like that so that was that was kind of fun um i didn't know really what to say to them (laughs) right (laughs) like like, i really hated you when i was a kid yeah (laughs) right (laughs) i've never heard that one before (laughs) but yeah So I did want to touch on this because it was part of the uh, interview uh, that was, uh, you know, the text in the new book. Mm -hmm. You did mention that originally you did a book, you know, Whoa Nelly. It was three issues that was set Mm -hmm. in the Love and Rockets universe. But you did mention that originally Whoa Nelly was supposed to be what this book was. So why did you abandon that and go with a more narrative, you know, typical comic structure for Whoa Nelly? One of the reasons was because... uh, it was originally supposed to be set up like a magazine, articles, photos, and titles, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, by the time I got to that, I go, I'm not going to write no articles. <laughs> <What's wrong laughs> with me? I'm not a writer like that, you know. And so, uh, and then the other reason was I didn't think people would accept that on its own terms, you know, uh, just wrestling. Mm-hmm. So I kind of put made it a, a continuity have some continuity from love and rockets in it. And that's why that it turned out the way it did. But originally it was supposed to just be here's wrestling. Here's wrestling pictures. Here's, here's a fake article about this match, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, but I, I jumped that and, but I was able to do it this time, you know? Right. For sure. And do you think that, uh, you'll ever do another wrestling related story in love and rockets or do you think that's past? You know, it's it's really interesting because um, since this this thing was such a private thing uh, originally, I just I'm very curious to see where my interests will lie after knowing that it's like out there and it's no longer a secret. I guess, for lack of a better term. So, will I go back to it, or do I need to go back to it? You know, because now you've seen it all. Now, now it's mm-hmm. all out out there. So I'm. Really curious to see what my uh, where my brain will take me, you know. Later, like maybe it's like it's like, well, I don't want to draw this anymore. I, I already did it, you know. Or or like, oh boy, I got more ideas for it, you know. I haven't I haven't gotten there yet. Mm-hmm. Well, and how far ahead of schedule do you stay? You all are working on volume four right now. Um, mm-hmm. I want to say there's nine or 10 issues out. I might be misspoken there. But how far ahead do you stay ahead of production schedule? Uh, pretty much I'm drawing 11 right now. Gilbert, okay. 11. We, um, it's due uh, in a month or two. I know it's coming out in the fall. And it there's not too much time between turning in the art and publishing it. 
So, gotcha. So I would say late late summer, early fall is the next one, and then I think about the the, the next one, like issue twelve. I don't know what's going on. In, you, know? <laughs> you know. So yeah, this stuff is pretty much just like close to uh, as close to the fans as it is to us. You know, like we're you know almost as much as we do by this point. You know. Has it always been that way, or is that just something that's happened? You know, as time has progressed. Yeah, for me, for me, it has. Gilbert okay. has a million ideas going at one time. You know, mm-hmm. uh, like five years planned. <laughs> you know, <laughs> before I'm usually uh, most of the time I'm I'm usually just like, okay, what's the next issue? Okay, Maggie's been in a bad mood. Okay, we'll make a story about her bad mood. You know, that's that's usually how I think about. It. You know, okay. it's it's rare that I'm I'm thinking about an epic ending. You know, <laughs> sometimes I am, but rare, rarely. Well, before we get into questions uh, on the back end, I do want to talk to you about like current comics in the scene just a little bit. But JB, do you have anything you want to talk about wrestling wise before we get into that? Yes, I have a couple yeah. of other things here. Um, yeah, go for yeah. it. So uh, when I was a kid, when I was younger, uh, after Sunday school. Every every day, me and a bunch of fools would get together and take over one of the back rooms and wrestle each other with like a, a pretend mat and like folding chairs. Did <laughs> you and your brothers ever do stuff like that? I um I remember uh, the kids in the neighborhood wrestling, you know, and then you know, do fake moves and, and stuff like that. But not a lot, you know. I was always the, one of the smaller cousins, and so they were like, "No, don't let him wrestle. He'll he'll cry." You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I remember my 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 cousins and and my brothers all trying to be Bobo Brazil or whatever. And I remember even my cousin gave a guy a real headbutt. Oh and, my god! And it hurt him more than the guy. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. So uh, that's amazing. <laughs> Usually, uh, the the prized horse of the group would be the smallest kid because we could pick them up and do all kinds of moves on them. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's true. And I, I was kind of that. And then I would hurt myself and, and cry and they'd go, all right, he's out of here. But I'd, I'd want to finish. You know? uh, were there any particular like wrestling moves that you really enjoy drawing? Because I feel like with wrestling, since it is such a physical uh, sport, for, for lack of a better term, it is kind of difficult to replicate those on the page in a 2D space. Sure. Sure. So um, yeah, yeah. I guess I, I guess I think about it like a photographer mm-hmm. catching the best moment. You know, like a a, a head scissors or a, you know, or um, if someone's flying, they're in the air. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Right. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, a headlock is always a is always a good one because they don't move. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, yeah, doing doing some kind of high flying fancy move, you, it's like the photographer taking you know twelve shots, and you, he has to pick one, right? You know that 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 kind of represents that move, you know. So yeah, that's how that's how I look at it when I draw it. And so, what were your like favorite moves to draw? Hmm. I know you mentioned the headlock; that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. And I was watching recently and going, do they still do headlocks? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> baby. I was like, I mean, I mean, that was when I was a kid. I mean, do they still use that or do people boo or, or you know, say boring? You know? No, no. Um, they're, they're fundamentals. They're part of uh, the basics of wrestling. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I like uh, I like to draw pile drivers. I like to draw because there's a certain air uh, movement even if it's still, what else I don't like to draw. I just I like a lot of the tangled ones, like a tangled um, a leg lock or something. Okay, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Because it's just fun to draw interlocking parts. Yeah, you know? and and I found out that a lot of when I do a sex scene, I go, "This is kind of like drawing a wrestling." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it really yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it it just. You know, being such a fan and and drawing that stuff since I was what little taught me a lot about action poses and uh, anatomy, interlocking body parts. You know, yeah, just just because I liked to watch and then I tried to draw what those wrestlers were doing, stuff like that. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, looking at your body of work, 
I don't know. It just, it's very clear that you have such a understanding and grasp of like human anatomy. Mm-hmm. And uh, it makes sense that all of that comes from drawing wrestlers because all you're doing is studying anatomy in that case. You know, it's sure. It's all about yeah. that physicality mm-hmm. of the human body. Yeah. I, I remember um, stripping my GI Joes of their clothes and putting them in wrestling positions. Oh, you know? wow. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> And my brother would go, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Did you uh, ever own any of those AWA Remco figures from the 70s and 80s? Uh, the the wrestling ones? Yes. Hmm. I know no, the- uh, because I'm older than you guys. So um, by that time, I wasn't doing that as much, you know, uh, by the especially by the 80s. I wasn't really buying a lot of figures and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But you knew about him, though. Yeah, I think I think I'm trying to. Um, are you thinking about the rubber ones, the WWF? No. So this line would have been before the LJN WWF figures. These were they almost look like He Man figures, mm-hmm. uh, but they had like these uh, soft rubbery heads, and there was Ric Flair. They did. Uh, the Road Warriors, uh, they did Kurt Hennig before he was Mr. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of other guys that ended up going to WWF a couple, like a decade later anyway, but I'm trying to think of the- Yeah, any- you know, I think I know which ones you're talking about. Yeah. Well, speaking of toys, this is kind of off topic, and there may have been some. Have there ever been Love and Rockets toys or statues? I feel like that's something that uh, people do in comics, but I don't know if I've seen any. That's uh, what I'd like to do. I've just never been approached. <laughs> okay. Yeah, really? it'd be cool to. Yeah, I, I mean, I would assume you know. I know Gary Painter's had figures. You know, Klaus has done it. I mean, mm-hmm. Ware's done it. It makes sense that you all would have had it by now. Yeah, I'm surprised yeah, nobody's yeah. approached um, you. I don't know. For some reason, Gilbert and I were all left off the uh, merchandise uh, train. You know, we were never approached for stuff like that, and I was too lazy to go get it myself. You know, and I didn't know how to how to be a businessman and, and uh, find out how to get it done. But, um, yeah, I was kind of like, wow, they got toys. Uh, you think that guy would come and <laughs> ask me? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be awesome. Uh, maybe you could, uh, maybe somebody will hear this and, you know, yeah. get in touch with you or, uh, you know, I don't know how you feel about Kickstarter, but I feel like that would be a hit for you uh, if you ever wanted to get it together. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I would love a, a, like a wrestling figure of one of your characters. I would too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So you heard it here, folks. Uh, somebody get in touch. Let's make this happen. Yeah, <laughs> for real. Do you have any favorite matches that you rewatch somewhat often, Jaime? Me? Um, yeah. Hmm. Gee whiz. That's a toughie. Um, some of my favorite matches were uh, back in the day when they didn't stay recorded. They didn't keep them, you know, out there. Right, <laughs> right. To do. Um, hmm. You know, I had favorite wrestlers who- uh, Gotcha. Who I liked to watch them wrestle. It was not so much the match. It was like, mm-hmm. you know, one of my favorite things about wrestling is when someone's going to have a wedding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and everything is set up and everything is nice. And you know, someone's going to come in and ruin it. Uh, like those things, man, give me a bell- bellyache, man. I'm just like, this is, this is the best. There's nothing like this in the world. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, WWE is definitely keeping that tradition strong. I was going to say, it seems like every five years yeah. it happens. Yeah. So, <laughs> And all the all the heel has to do is just walk in calmly and everyone starts to panic. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 I'm just here. I'm just here. And then pretty soon people are thrown through the sets and stuff. <laughs> well, before we uh, get into listener questions, I do want to kind of just change gears into comics do you keep up with a lot of what's going on presently, or is it just something that you watch passively? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm just. Um, I just don't have the energy to look for new stuff. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it comes my way. Sometimes I, it's by accident. But I'm just. Uh, I've been doing this so long that I just care about what I'm doing. Right. You know? you know. And then once in a while, someone comes along, and I'm like, Oh wow, this is good. You know, where was I? Well, you were in your room drawing your comics. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any, you know, newer cartoonists that you would want to, you know, talk about enjoying, you know, just throw some names out there? Um, sure. Uh, um, of course, there's Katie Skelly, but I'm playing favorites there. <laughs> <laughs> 
There's that kid that, see, I don't even know his name. Is it Jasper? Yeah, tw- just turned 20 Does years the- old. Oh, yeah, yep. yeah. We've had him on. Dynamite Diva, yeah, he's incredible. Yeah, I, I just um, discovered him not two weeks ago. And uh, he reminds me of a time when the alternative boom in the 80s reminds me a lot of that stuff. And uh, I love his energy, you know, and his humor and, and stuff. And, you know, he's 20 years old. We'll see how, how long before he burns out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we joke with him all the time uh because uh i have a group chat with him and we're like you need to slow down because otherwise you're going to be done in three years and yeah. uh doing just illustration work <laughs> right right or like hey there's money in animation last time you ever hear that person yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Has there been, have you had any animation offers? Because, I mean, that's one thing. You've stayed true to comics your entire career. Yeah. Um, just, um, like, offers to, to do my stuff. And mm-hmm. when they ask me, first thing I think of is live action. And then halfway through the conversation, I realize, oh, they're talking about a cartoon. I never think about a cartoon when I'm doing my my stuff. But um, the, once or twice, people have said, um, I would love if you would do some character creations you know for us and stuff like that and i'll go like "Eh, yeah maybe and then i forget (laughs) (laughs) well you did mention like a live action adaptation uh obviously you're going to be close to your own work do you have any dream casting for those characters if there was to be a live action adaptation of your work oh i i would think of i i can only think of unknowns you know because nobody Mm -hmm. fits you know Right. Once in a while, some I'll see someone. They go, "Hey, they can play this one minor character that has one speaking part, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or something like that." You know, once in a while. But as far as like a Maggie and a Hopi, I don't think they exist. You know, of course mm-hmm. they do, but I can't picture it. They they just it's just too close to me, you know. And mm-hmm. I can't think of someone else making it theirs. You know. Uh, yeah, for like sure. A, like a. Well, you got to let the character grow. You got to let the actor grow and let him, you know, do this. And I go, well, what if they become less Maggie? You know, <laughs> so that's that's always a tough choice for me of making those decisions. Mm-hmm. All righty, uh, Jaime, we did actually get a lot of questions for you, record breaking amount. Um, however, because there were so many, uh, we just went ahead and uh, picked a few that would kind of cover the basis of what everyone was trying to ask. JB, do you want to ask the first one? All right. First question comes from friend of the show, Nate Garcia Cartoons. What's up, Nate? Uh, oh, hi, mate. You should check out his work. Awesome. I think you'd dig it. He's another 18-year-old wonder kid. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> uh, he asked, as per usual, okay, what did you have for breakfast today? And be honest. Uh, I had uh, a glass of orange juice or half a glass because I used up the rest of it. And uh, a bowl of morning oat crunch cereal. Oh. Are you a, a pulp person or no pulp? Either one. You know, okay. I noticed there's a lot less pulp in orange juice that I can find, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I, I Either one. Hell yeah. All righty. Next question came from Andrew Lorenzi. Andrew asked, Hi, May. How has making comics changed for you over the years? Um, hopefully not too much because I want to keep it as lively as possible still. I'm still a little kid doing it. But uh, how it's changed is keeping up with the times or not keeping up with the times. There's so much water under the bridge, so much stuff that was kind of new in the early days. People have caught up. And so I have to think about keeping it fresh, even if it's there's 20 other characters out there like them. <laughs> and uh, it's it's kind of a, you know, a juggling act. And I, I just try, still try to keep it fresh, but our original way of doing it was Gilbert and I, really early on, people would go, God, Love and Rockets is so original. And I'd go, well, I would prefer to say it's good <laughs> <laughs> than original. Because, I mean, it's hard, you know, you're going to kill yourself trying to be original. But uh, all we, we focused on was uh, trying to do it better than the next guy, you know. Mm -hmm. And kind of before I get into the next question, I kind of want to ask, you know, looking back on it, you know, you've had decades, you know, the body of work spans decades. Are you happy with the legacy of Love and Rockets, uh, you know, from your side of things? Yeah, 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 I am. I um, it's it's funny how um, in the last 40 years I saw us go from hot newcomers to, uh, well, this isn't 
this isn't as cool as people said it was to, oh, they're not the new kids on the block anymore. Let's read this comic instead to, hey, uh, there's a bunch of people over in uh, Minnesota uh, that are really into your work, have rediscovered your work. And I'm like, oh, cool. And then and then going back to like, oh, he did, he did the best collection. This is the best book possible. <laughs> and mm-hmm. then like, okay, now let's go somewhere else because that book's over. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and then someone going, oh, Mr. Hernandez, you're an icon. And then two weeks later, you're not. <laughs> so, so overall, yes, I, I really like Legacy. But, and I've seen the ups and downs, and they're all fine. You know, I, I have no regrets. Good. Awesome. RJ Casey writes, uh, what's up, RJ? He asked, how does he feel about the Dodgers' chances this year? <laughs> Speaking of RJ, there's a, there's a, a Dodger that me and friends call RJ. Um <laughs> Um, I think they got a, g- a good chance. Uh, according to yesterday's game, not didn't doesn't look like it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, right now the them and the Giants are battling for who's the best in the league. Blah blah blah. But uh, I think they do. I mean, if they don't, then I've seen it after all these years. <laughs> and his follow up question: Do you think you'll ever make a baseball comic? Probably not a full baseball comic, but um, I like I like drawing uh, baseball. I did the one story about softball, which same thing, you know, same action poses. And then I had this story where Angel and her dad are out in the park pitching and hitting. So that that stuff is fun for me. So a whole baseball comic, I don't know if I have enough in me to do a whole comic. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's a that's a pretty big ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All righty. Uh, Margot Dent wrote in and asked, "What do you think is the most successful relationship in Love and Rockets?" Uh, you are you talking about uh, characters' relationships or the relationship to something else? I mean, the actual- I'm going to assume they meant like relationships uh, amongst the characters. Amongst the characters, successful. Hmm. All of them. Well, a pretty successful one that's that's starting to become rocky is is uh, Maggie and Ray. Mm-hmm. It seems like they've become complacent old folks. Yet um, there's there's stuff always coming up, you know, to bring doubts. Like uh, like after uh, is this how you see me? You know, Maggie has to live with the fact that she was going to cheat on him. She didn't mm-hmm. wouldn't do it successfully, but that's always in the back of her mind. And the fact that he kind of knows but doesn't know, you know, that it's just all this stuff going on in their heads um, and in my head. But uh, so far their, their uh, relationship is, uh, is better than Maggie and Hopi's. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Hell yeah. <laughs> all right. Instagram user Paul along the watchtower asked favorite Lucha mask. Let's see. Uh, maybe I kind of liked uh, Mil Mascara's mask when he had the big teeth, the big mm-hmm. groom with the sharp teeth. Maybe. That's a good one. It's a, it's real toughy. Uh, when I was a kid, I loved the Destroyer's mask. That's yes. I was going to say that you mentioned him before, and that is like such a classic look. Yeah, like that blue mask with the red outlines. Yeah, yeah. I met uh, Dick Byer. Is that his name? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I met him in an elevator in Vegas, and uh, I did that thing. By the way, Mister Byer, um, <laughs> you know. You were my first wrestling hero when I was five years old or whatever. And he was just like, oh, you know, oh, that's great. Oh, that was a long time ago. Ha, ha, ha. You know, he he was very (laughs) grateful. And But I felt bad talking to him as a guy without a mask. You know, it's kind of like the sacredness of the of the the mystery of you wear a mask because it's a secret identity thing. And there I was calling him out without a <laughs> mask. And I, I felt like I betrayed the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole thing. There was another time. Now I'm remembering meeting wrestlers. Um, I was, I was living in LA and, uh, I saw uh, Gene LaBelle, who was a famous. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. He was big, big in LA. The LaBelles ran, you know, wrestling there. And uh, I saw him eating at a <laughs> at a cafe. And I ran home and I got my eight by ten of uh, of the Hangman, which was one of his alter egos back in the day. Although I didn't know it till I was uh, older. 
And I stupidly, you know, he, he and his wife come out of the thing at night and I'm like, Mr. LaBelle, look, could you sign? And I could tell I pissed him off, but uh, he signed it. He goes, I will sign this for my friend, Mr. Hangman. <laughs> <laughs> you go, man. And I, and I felt bad then too. Like, how could I, uh, I was calling him out for being a secret guy, you know? Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that does show how times have changed because stuff like that was taken very, very seriously. Yeah, yeah, especially in Mexico. Oh, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember when, uh, what's his name? Uh, he was in WCW before uh, WWE, you know, famous guy. Remember? Rey Mysterio? The guy, yeah, Rey Mysterio. Mm-hmm. He, um, I remember in uh, when he and Eddie Guerrero had that big feud in WCW and uh, some, like, he had to go to the hospital and they had to cut his mask off to, you know, to work on him. And I just remember one of the announcers, I can't remember, just go, oh my God, that's sacred in Mexico. You can't do that to him. <laughs> and I felt so good that they were keeping the, <laughs> keep, keeping the old way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For real. <laughs> I think when he got unmasked, that was kind of a big deal too. Yeah. yeah, like I remember he went to WWE and they wanted to put him back under a mask. Yeah. And like people in Mexico were like, no, you yeah, lost right. it. And it would insult, yeah. <laughs> you know, the tradition if you put it back on. Mm-hmm. But I guess money talks, you know? Yeah, yeah. Ray Mysterio gets a pass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Next question came from uh, Instagram user Blues Drive Monster 95. Uh, what were your parents' reactions to your stories, specifically stories that center on Izzy? Uh, my mom was just happy we had jobs. I, I swear, that's it. <laughs> that's awesome. She was just, uh, oh, you do comics. Because she, you know, turned us on to comics and, and stuff like that. And she was just happy we didn't become street thugs or whatever, you know. And I do feel like you bring that up a lot in interviews when talking about, you know, how you came to comics. There were always comics around your home. So did your parents actually read your work since they were fans of comics, your mom specifically? My mom did. Um, my dad was uh, died when I was younger. So okay. I don't think he ever got into what we were doing. But he was the one who would encourage us to draw, period, just to shut mm-hmm. us up, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, mom mom was reading it for a while. Then it got a little too tough for her. I blame Gilbert mostly. <laughs> 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 and um, I remember the day that I went over to her house and I was like, hi, mom, what's new? You know, this and, that. and she uh, she had a, my stack of Love and Rockets and she goes, I'm giving these back to you because I, I don't read them anymore and stuff like that. <laughs> And instead of going, Mom, you you know, you broke my heart, my dream, my, you know, this and that. I was like, oh, too dirty, huh? (laughs) (laughs) And so I was like, okay, so at least we know where Mom stands. Uh (laughs) (laughs) It's always nice to have your mom keep you honest. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) All right. On Instagram, Odin Cabal asked, what do you do when you're having trouble resolving a storyline? I concentrate on the other story that I'm working on, and I, I get back to it later. It's always good to have two storylines going because, you know, one's going to just stop you in its tracks. And that's why I have uh, the Maggie Donta stuff going at one part, and then I have the Princess Animus goofy science fiction stuff on the other side. Mm-hmm. And I get to, when I'm stuck on one, I concentrate on the other. It saves me time. <laughs> Right, yeah. I hate to look at it that way, but, you know, I am thinking about a deadline. Yeah, and I mean, you're just staying efficient, you know, at the yeah, end of the day. Yeah. So, uh, last question uh, brings it back to wrestling from Instagram user Mob Van Dam. Best suplex variation. Wow. I don't know. Beside the fact that I don't know the names of them anymore, you know, the names of all the moves mm-hmm. yeah. that they've been given. I like when I discover them, like, wow, that's a good name or whatever, but... So, uh, suplex, uh, hmm, gee whiz, I'm stumped. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm partial to the classic German suplex. I think that, uh, it looks cool still to this day, despite mm-hmm. being one of the oldest. Mm-hmm. Pins their shoulders to the mats, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. We could say suple, you know? Yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, my personal favorite would probably be the Saito suplex or suple. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, just, it's a snappiness and in intensity. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's something about that when it connects and that impact. 
I, I don't know. I just really, that really gets me. <laughs> right, right. I guess I'm more partial to uh, pile drivers. Yeah. Yeah. It's a devastating like a move. Yeah. I mean, that, that yeah. was like the, always the end all be all. I feel like right, for a while. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That used to, that used to end matches. Now it's just starts matches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, some guys do end it with the, with a pile driver though, or some kind of pile driver variation. But I feel like usually the characters that do that are like the old school characters. Right. Like their character right. is supposed to be like a throwback. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. Minoru Suzuki. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that about does it, uh, you know, for the uh, questions. Uh, before we do get out of here today, uh, we do want to thank you so much for coming on, Jaime, and for participating with the Autoptic panel uh, in discussions this year. Where can people find your uh, work, you know, keep up with you online? Oh, I guess uh, Fanographics. Dot com is that what it's called? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just draw these things. <laughs> but um, yeah, Fanographics will have uh, just about all of it. Okay. Hell yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, thank you all as always for listening. Uh, thanks to Autoptic for having us again this year. And uh, as always, stay gutter. Stay gutter.